and I was not going to mislead them. I think that that was probably uh, the, the, the basis of the bond that uh, developed uh, between myself and uh, Carol Ann and David. In the hours after his germ-free birth, baby David was transported to the clinical research center for testing. They brought him to the unit in the little bitty bubble so that they could hook him up to get the air and everything. And he was just adorable. He was a beautiful baby. He didn't really look like a newborn. All this black hair, it's just precious. A simple blood test would tell in just a few days whether David, like his brother, was lacking the white blood cells necessary for a healthy immune system. We got a call about a week after David was born and asked us to come in. We were driving in very optimistic, very hopeful. We sat down with Dr. Montgomery and Dr. South, and they presented us with the news that David did, in fact, have skid. We were, we were devastated. We were so um, heartsick. Before she left the hospital, Ms. Vetter came to see him. And she had tears in her eyes. She, of course, had just lost the other baby. And um, she looked at me and she said, uh, I can't fall in love with this one and be hurt again. I don't think it ever occurred to them this could happen again. Even though they went along with what might be happening, and she had faith in the church and she had faith in Raphael and she couldn't separate the two. Mary Murphy would become one of David's most dedicated carers. She feels that the Vetters had rushed their decision to have another child. It was just a couple of months and you don't get over grief of losing a child. And then somebody comes along and say, you can have another boy and, and we can make it all right. I, I, I think almost any woman in that emotional state would have probably made the same decision. Despite the emotional turmoil, Carol Ann Vetter succumbed to her baby son. I felt if I could stay distant from him, then if the worst happened, I could handle it better. So I was hesitant to reach into the glove and touch him. But once I did, I was hooked for life. Although the diagnosis had been a blow for the Vetters, David was safely inside Raphael Wilson's plastic bubble, and the doctors were confident they could cure him. Oh, that was incredibly exciting to think that finally we're going to get one that's not in the way to the graveyard right now. The second child certainly held out the possibility of joining uh, the elite bunch. Uh, we were not Boston. We were not New York. We were anxious personally and for the medical center and for the city to uh, go up with the big boys. In fact, Dr. Raphael Wilson had been close to testing the procedure before. Two years earlier, he had placed skid twins into an isolator. But before the planned bone marrow transplant, the twins' immune systems spontaneously began working, and they were released from isolation. We wanted one that would live long enough for us to see whether the transplant worked. It usually took six weeks to uh, maybe three months or even longer for you to see the result of the transplant. But in their confidence, the doctors had taken for granted that Catherine, a perfect match for her first brother, David Joseph, would also match David Philip. The doctors knew that the odds of finding a perfect sibling match were one in four. The odds of finding a match from an unrelated donor were one in hundreds of thousands. So this had always been a long shot perhaps a longer shot than they had ever been willing to face up to. It was an unspoken understanding that he would match Catherine, we would transplant him, it would work, and he would come out, and we would all be joyful and 
may be famous. The doctors were optimistic that they could move straight forward into a successful bone marrow transplant. They had expected Catherine to be a perfect match for David. And then came the devastating news that Catherine was not a match. We just didn't even, we didn't make plans ahead of time. If he's got this disease, uh, we'll look for a matching donor, and probably he'll match Catherine like his brother did, and we'll give him the transplant, and uh, he'll be well. I don't know if confused is a good word for the doctors. We were certainly confused. There were a lot of theories. They told us that David would have to stay inside this germ-free environment. Once we gathered ourselves, then we said, okay, now what? What happens now? My problem with the medical team is that they, they offered a, a bit too much hope. They offered too much, and they gave too much, and they trapped themselves. In what seemed like an instant, the isolator had gone from a stopgap measure to David's permanent home. Little more than an inflated balloon, the bubble was fed with a constant flow of filtered air. It comprised of a five foot by three foot living chamber connected to an even smaller supply bubble. David had to be handled through thick black neoprene gloves spaced at intervals throughout the isolator. Everything he ate, wore or touched had to be sterilized with parasitic acid and placed inside steel capsules inserted through a system of airlocks. Even David's doctors weren't certain the bubble would hold up. I had no idea that this situation would work for the next week, much less for the next year. I kept expecting to walk in any day and in, in my worst nightmare, just see him falling apart. Unsure of just how long the isolator would last, David's doctors threw themselves into vigorous research. They scoured the world for leads on how to perform a transplant without matching bone marrow. They also took the opportunity to study David himself to better understand the human immune system. Finally, finally, here was something that we had to work with. We were able to watch the progression of this disease uninfected for the first time in history. Primed by David's doctors and the hospital's public relations department, the media eagerly reported what one newspaper called the miracle in Houston. There's a very special little boy here, one who is waiting to leave the hospital for good and go outside. The interest in David from his germ-free birth forward built over time and he became a celebrity in his own right. News stories don't mention his last name in order to give some privacy to a little boy and his family, but the story of David, the boy who lives in a bubble, has been told all over the world. The story told over and over again to the American public in David's early years was that this was very successful, that this was a very happy, intelligent, active, thriving child, and that the cure was just coming right around the corner. Dr. Wilson, how do you assess David's development? Uh, physically, he is well-developed, he is strong, his muscular development is normal, his psychological development, if anything, is uh, ahead. David never questioned in the early years why he was in a bubble. It was routine for him to have his mother hold him with black gloves on. In the beginning, you know, children, their needs are very simple. So David's needs were very simple. But as the months passed and bone marrow registries failed to find a matching donor for David, the doctors were starting to face an uncomfortable truth. Nothing seemed to offer real hope and most of the procedures offered real danger. And as long as the isolator was working, 
We didn't have to do anything. The bubble was successful for David. It did protect him. And now they had no way out. There was no way to conscientiously, in their thinking, remove this happy child from this protective environment and expose him to the dangers of the world. How do you kill a child? While they waited for a cure, the doctor